Hi, hello. Good day, everyone. Hey. Hi, Alish Pra. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very, very well, thank you. I just want to say a very warm welcome to all of our listeners. Um, uh, merci à tous in Montreal. And to all of you tuning in across Canada and all the different time zones and all over the world, it's such a great pleasure for, uh, for us to participate in Campus Party this year. And um, I'll introduce myself very briefly. My name is Hilary Carter. I'm the Managing Director of the Blockchain Research Institute, a global think tank based in Toronto, Canada. And um, we're thrilled to bring this conversation uh, to Campus Party with MCI Group. And we've been working with MCI as conference partner at Blockchain Revolution Global, uh, which is an important blockchain for enterprise conference that we're hosting in October later on this year. So we hope you'll join us for that on October 29th and 30th. And just like today, we're going to bring together uh, leaders and practitioners in blockchain technology to share insights and um, lessons on how we can work together to use technology um, to create inspiring solutions for a new global order. Not unlike what Campus Party is doing today to try to reboot the world through uh, positive and inspiring conversations around technology. So last year, I had the a great pleasure of working with um, uh, my co-panelist, uh, uh, Alishba Imran, who joins me today. Alishba is a talented uh, young innovator, and she's the winner of uh, the Enterprise Blockchain Awards inaugural Young Leaders Award for some of the incredible work that she's doing researching not just blockchain technology, but all kinds of other technologies as well. Uh, she joined our co-founder, Don Tapscott, in a main stage discussion to talk about what inspires her about blockchain and other technologies. And uh, more than a year later, I'm incredibly pleased to sit down with you, Alishba, and catch up on some of the exciting work that you're doing. Um, and just to note to our audience to please uh, don't be shy in asking questions in the chat. Take this opportunity to uh, ask, uh, ask us anything, ask, ask Alishba anything. Uh, so, Alishba, why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about yourself, your education, and what inspired you to pursue technology as a field of interest? Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for that for that great introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Alishba. I'm currently 17 years old, and I'm really passionate about using different emerging technologies like machine learning, blockchain, um, and thinking about ways we can use these to solve some really big problems in the world. So specifically, I've been really interested um, in the finance, healthcare, and energy sector, and trying to really identify problems in these areas that I could potentially tackle using these technologies. So initially, uh, I got really interested in these technologies through a human accelerator program that I was a part of called TKS, the Knowledge Society. Um, and through this program, it's essentially like Olympic level training, but for like CEOs and people who want to go out there and tackle really big problems and using, using technology specifically. Um, so through that program, got exposed to these technologies and started to build a lot of projects. Um, and like Hillary mentioned, I initially started out in the blockchain space and the product that I ended up building there was actually for counterfeit medication, which is a huge problem in the developing world where almost 40% of their medication can be counterfeit. Um, and so I got interested in tackling this problem and realized we can uh, basically do supply chain management using blockchain to track where these products are coming from and where they're going. So essentially at a high level, that was a product and I got to work a little bit with IBM to develop that and hopefully implement it later on. Um, and now I'm, I'm kind of diving my feet a little bit more into machine learning. And so I've been working on two main projects. One is within robotics and improving prosthetics using different deep learning techniques. Um, so I'm working with Hanson Robotics to uh, also implement that into their, uh, their robot. You might've heard of Sophia, uh, their, their most common robot. Um, and then I'm also working uh, on a product in energy storage. So looking at ways we can use machine learning to accelerate uh, our research and development for energy storage systems. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So you're 17 years old and you came into um, uh, the Knowledge Society, this uh, organization. How did you find the Knowledge Society or did they find you? Yeah, so I actually, it was, I was at a, like the story is just, I was at a, I was at a robotic camp um, and so somebody just really told me about it and I just kind of looked it up and I thought it was really interesting because um, I was looking through the website and I saw all of these kids that were working on real projects. And for me, I think that was always the thing I wanted to do. Like I was always passionate about tackling these problems and, and I got exposed to, you know, some of these really big problems getting to live in developing countries previously. Um, and I realized like there's not enough people actually looking at ways we can tackle 
tackle these problems. And so I always had that passion in me to go in and solve these problems, but I don't think I had, you know, the right exposure. I didn't have the right community. And really in school, you don't learn about, you know, if you're ambitious, you want to solve problems, like how do you actually go about doing that? Um, and so through the program, I got a lot of that exposure, a lot of the resources and community to, to kickstart my growth that way. So when you first came um, into blockchain technology, what did you think? This was like cryptocurrency or were you surprised that there were other exciting things that you could do with blockchain? Yeah, I think when you hear about blockchain, you just kind of hear about Bitcoin. Like that's kind of what comes to mind. You hear about cryptocurrency, like crypto trading. Uh, so for me, it was it was pretty shocking to see that just the technology itself can be applied to solve some really big problems. Um, and, you know, there are companies that are looking at ways to do that in different spaces. Um, but yeah, for me, it was it was interesting seeing, you know, the different wide range of applications. And I think just this fundamental idea of having a decentralized system is so important, especially because uh, of, you know, data privacy issues in the future, as we're sharing more and more data on the Internet and the Web and um, especially like healthcare information, I think is, is super important here. Um, and so for me, I realized like there's a huge application here to just use that like fundamental infrastructure of decentralization to tackle problems in different systems. So, you know, one system could be like banking another system is like the government, um, even just the web, like what's what's a way we can decentralize that. And so I think within that, there's some really interesting applications within digital identity, uh, supply chain management, like I mentioned. So for me, that was very interesting. And that's what got me excited was you know, the applications of this in the real world uh, to tackle these real world problems. You had some personal inspiration, a family member who was impacted by um, by products that were that were not legit. Do you want to tell our audience about about that and uh, that kind of igniter and motivator in you to do further research in this area? Yeah, for sure. So I was um, I was actually on a trip uh, to India and I got to visit some people there, um, got to visit a lot of rural areas within there as well. So I got to interact with a lot of different people um, and I was just kind of talking to them to better understand what are some problems that these guys are facing. Obviously, lots of different issues like not having access to energy, um, you know, clean drinking water. But one of the ones I found shocking that we you know usually don't hear about was actually the counterfeit industry. Um, and not just in medication, but really in everything, all kinds of foods, even clothing. Um, but when it comes to medication, there's a huge impact on health, obviously, because if you're consuming this, uh, you know, there's millions of deaths that end up happening. And there's lots of reasons for it. But, you know, other, outside of not just being educated, it's also the fact that there's literally no infrastructure to track these medications. And these products are just on shelves and we're buying them, but we don't understand where they're coming from. And so that got me really interested because uh, it was something I didn't really expect. And so learning more about that was interesting. And, and there I actually met a family who was telling me about their son and how he he actually fell ill after having counterfeit medication. Um, and so that's really that story and, and hearing that personal story really got me excited. And I wanted to dive deeper into blockchain because I was looking at it at the time. And, I, and so I just saw this interesting intersection between the two. So how did you begin your blockchain journey? Yeah, <laughs> actually, when I started out, I was looking at a lot of uh, a lot of the resources that you guys have uh, blockchain research institution, you guys have some really good resources. Um, so I was watching like Don Tapscott Scott, like the, his talks and, and you guys have some books as well. So um, just reading up on those was really good just to get contextual knowledge about the industry in general. Um, but yeah, I started out kind of just learning about, um, you know, doing courses, just learning about Bitcoin, learning about cryptocurrencies. And then diving deeper more into just this technology in general and how I could potentially start building my own applications, you know, things like smart contracts, uh, D apps, decentralized applications. So that's kind of how I got started, just doing a lot of courses, um, but then also building things because I didn't want to just have this knowledge. I wanted to hopefully do something with it. Um, so started just watching tutorials and trying to replicate projects. And then um, eventually I started to kind of build my skills in, in the development area and I started to create my own application here. That's amazing. And that's a great path for anybody who wants to learn more is to, to take advantage of some of the resources that are available. Don Tapscott's TED Talk. If you've never heard about blockchain, that's a phenomenal place to start. Um, uh, looking, uh, look us up at Blockchain Research Institute. We've got lots of resources available to anyone who wants to, to dive in and get more involved. Um, Alishba, now that we're in uh, 
COVID-19 and we have the possibility of a global vaccine, what do you think the role of a technology like blockchain is going to be uh, for rolling out a legitimate a uh, vaccine um, and one that's authentic and, and certified by the manufacturer. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting and, and relevant kind of application there as well, um, because there there's, you know, vaccine development happening. Um, and so I do think there's a lot of applications there where you can do like supply chain management, for example, and, and understand where these vaccines are coming from and how they're being created. Um, but I also just think in general, like blockchain is really good for creating standards and kind of regulations around these kind of products um, in a way where there's no like central authority controlling it. So, you know, you don't want to have like a central authority that is controlling the vaccines and the flow of the vaccines where they're going. I think it could be interesting to put this onto a blockchain system um, and have like a peer to peer network where you're able to track the medication or, or the vaccine in this case. Um, but without having that like central authority um, and still having, you know, a regulation and standards that you can use uh, using the blockchain technology. Yeah, what's exciting is that the regulatory um, protocols and um, the standards can be coded in right from the outset so that uh, all the transactions are always on on side and legitimate. So we're pretty excited about those applications, too. We we published a report uh, called Blockchain Solutions and Pandemics uh, early in um, mm -hmm. in April, and um, it was um, compelling how many different applications uh, of blockchain there there could be to to mitigate pand uh, pandemics uh, from from happening in the first place, and also to help manage them once they uh, once they emerge. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you are, you've moved on to some really cool projects, which you uh, described just very briefly at the outset of the talk. Could you tell us a little bit more about your work in uh, supercell technology, how you got into it, uh, what the project is all about? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm actually working with, with, with a few students um, that are really passionate about the energy storage space. And so energy storage in, in itself, we don't often hear about this problem, but it's actually a huge problem. Um, if you think about renewables, like the prices of renewables are going down significantly to the point where they could be competitive with non-renewables. Um, but the main reason why we aren't implementing it, or one of the reasons at least, is energy storage. Um, like the sun is shining one day, but it might not be shining all the time. And so you need, you know, to be able to store the right amount of energy. Um, and currently we don't have enough energy storage capacity, which means like we need a lot more energy storage systems, almost uh, 20x more um, within the next 10 years to reach our goal uh, of like 45% of our renewables. Um, yeah, power being generated by renewables. And so realizing that I got really passionate about the problem and wanted to see if there was a way to just help accelerate a process so that we could improve um, the development of these energy storage systems. And so when I broke down the value chain, I realized that a lot of the energy storage systems like batteries, and then I'm also looking at super capacitors, um, is actually within the research and development process. So it'll take anywhere from three months to a couple of years because these manufacturers and companies will manually test a cell to see how long it'll last. And that's just one of the requirements, but also for research and development. And so after talking to some really big companies in the space, realized that if we could accelerate this process, it would be a huge value add, right? Saving time, saving costs and money. Um, and so, yeah, we're basically using previous test data and feeding it into like a machine learning model um, and machine learning is really good because it's able to kind of predict the final lifetime without having to actually do the entire test and so we can reduce the time by around 96 percent um, so that's kind of a, at a high level what the project is about and we're currently in the process of figuring out partnerships and ways to get data uh, and hopefully building out the product wow that sounds amazing are these companies international are they based in canada how did you connect with uh with uh some of these organizations? Yeah, so actually they're they're kind of international, like a lot of, there's a lot of different manufacturers. Uh, if you think about like Tesla, um, there's a company that Tesla bought out called Maxwell and Maxwell's creating like super capacitors. Um, and Tesla's obviously doing a lot of innovation in the battery space. So a lot of companies like that um, and other manufacturers as well in this space that have kind of been around for a while. and. Uh, really, the main attraction for these guys was like they 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 have been doing this for a long time, and so they have a lot of data, um, and that's why there's a value add because when there's a lot of data, you can actually just use machine learning. Oftentimes, that's what you'll find, and so 
um, that's why these companies are, are excited about you know this this project. Amazing. Um, and there's another one, which are you working on the robotics project simultaneously, or um, is it is it uh, has it has it come and gone? Tell us a little bit about the robotics uh, work that you're doing. Yeah, so robotics is more so just because I was I was really interested in hardware um, and interested to learn more about ways we can apply like the software side to hardware. Um, but yeah, the problem that I'm kind of looking at is within prosthetics. So I knew somebody who had a prosthetic arm. Um, and yeah, what I realized was like prosthetics are very expensive. So they can cost upwards of like $100,000 like with the really high end ones. And if you don't have healthcare insurance, that's a lot of money that most people can't afford. Um, and the other part to that is the actual gripping and the grasping of the prosthetic arm is not very accurate. Um, and so often like users are manually controlling it to like lift up an object or what, what else it may be. Um, and so essentially realize that um, we can accelerate that process uh, or improve that process uh, using like different deep learning techniques. And so that's what I'm trying to do right now. Um, and so, yeah, essentially 3D printed my own prosthetic arm, which costs significantly less than what currently exists. And now I'm just trying to figure out how I can use different techniques. So still in the process of just learning and, and building that out, but hopefully I can have some sort of working prototype soon. So tell me about how um, you approached the organization. How did you get involved with, uh, I think you said it was Hanson Robotics. Mm -hmm. um, was that yeah. your initiative? And uh, how did that all unfold? Because that it's sometimes hard to get in the door at an organization and, and start doing things. Yeah, I think it always helps to, to talk to people. Um, and that's one of the skills that I realized is like taking initiative is so important. Um, so I think in school, you're you're always kind of told to just stick by the rules, right? Like you're always given this criteria. Um, if you want to get this grade, just do this. And so that was my mindset going into just doing this work. I was like, okay, I'm just going to do my work and somehow people will just find out about it. Um, the reality is, is like, that's not true. You have to take initiative, reach out to people. And so just started like cold emailing people um, and also just went to a lot of events and conferences and I would meet people there. Um, so I actually knew somebody who knew... Uh, the, the founder at Hanson Robotics. And so uh, just got introduced to him and and just really, it was just a spontaneous chat. And I was just curious to learn about his work, but he got very interested in my work and was open to supporting it. Um, so that's really how it unfolded. I think if you just have like you go in with like no expectations, but you're willing to reach out to people and take that initiative. I think people are always willing to help, um, especially if you're young, like people love talking to, to young people. So I think, Definitely, if you're afraid of reaching out to people or, or scared, then I recommend just kind of cold emailing and seeing where it goes. Yeah, I um, people have, give, have asked, how do I get started? How do I get involved in blockchain? And I've broken it down into three different buckets. Um, I, I classify the first as being internal uh, learning or intrinsic learning, things that you can do on your own time. You can read, you can watch videos, you can take online courses, um, that sort of independent and then there's the external component which you spoke about which is showing up at conferences and getting out there in the community and having these sort of external um, networking opportunities and uh, um, live in-person opportunities which is why it's so great that that even though we're in a pandemic we're still able to have this kind of connectivity through through campus party and other uh, conferences like blockchain revolution global so it's really important to to get out in the community and show up and and uh, volunteer get involved but then i think the third thing is uh, very very important and and that's experiential learning and hands-on learning so unless we're we're actually hands-on with the technology it's very difficult to grasp some of the concepts and some of the theories. So I'm a big advocate of, mm -hmm. if you wanna learn a little bit more about blockchain, buy some Bitcoin, like $50 worth of Bitcoin or, or a very small mm -hmm. amount, just to have your, your hands on it and understand what a decentralized uh, network really looks like. In your case, you've gotten hands on and gotten into a lab and you've, you've been actually building and doing. So that takes your, your development to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I think being able to, to reach out to people, um, but also, yeah, like learning the skills, like I think there's there's no way to get around that. Like if you want to start building something, you have to learn the technical skills and it's going to be hard. But I think when you start it, you know, there's a lot of resources out there to help you. So for me, that was a huge turning point was when I 
you know, stop making excuses for myself and started just doing um, and trying to figure things out. That's so inspiring. There's a comment that says so impressive and courageous, <laughs> Alishba, and I couldn't agree more with that. Um, it's been a real pleasure for me to watch you develop your career at such a young age and your interests, and you are a real self-starter and uh, you've taken a lot of initiative. And one of the things that I've been delighted to see is that you've done a lot of speaking engagements at conferences. Um, last year, Blockchain Revolution Global, being on the main stage with Don Tapscott. You've had some other international speaking opportunities, which I think are really valuable for both career development, but also for your trajectory. trajectory. And I'd love for you to, to share um, one of the more recent uh, speaking engagements that you were able to, to uh, secure for yourself. Tell us about that one. Yeah, um, I was actually, it was uh, it was in January um, before everything was the pandemic, but I got to basically go to uh, CES, which is one of the largest uh, consumer electronic conferences around the world. Um, and yeah, I basically won an award there for the blockchain project that I actually mentioned in, in healthcare. Um, so I got to just talk, just kind of speak there about my work and also got to attend the entire conference. So that was really good exposure getting to kind of see what the top conference looks like with, you know, some of the some of the top people in the industry. Um, so yeah, that was one of the recent things that I've done. But in terms of speaking opportunities, I think they're great um, in terms of being able to, you know, meet new people and just get out there out of your comfort zone. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely recommend, you know, like if you haven't, then just just try to go to events even, just talk to people and, and try to just kind of get out of your comfort zone. I think when you start to be okay with being uncomfortable, um, I know it sounds cliche, but it, it does help a lot with like confidence and in just in yourself, um, being able to kind of kickstart your growth. Yeah. And some people might find it might be easier to start small and then scale up to bigger, bigger audiences when they feel more comfortable. But uh, it's amazing to see because not all people who have um, uh, very highly technical skill sets are able to um engage and communicate in in such an eloquent fashion as as you and it takes a lot of training and practice i think you're naturally talented on so many levels and uh, it's really inspiring to see but i think your advice is spot on that that people do have to push themselves and get out of their comfort zones and if you're uncomfortable you're probably in the right place and you're probably doing the right thing to push yourself um yeah one of the other things that i've noticed in my uh, inbox is uh, a, a newsletter from from you, from Alishba, giving me regular mm -hmm. updates of uh, what you're doing. So you've started to blog and you've started to write. Um, what inspired you to to pick up that kind of communication uh, initiative? Yeah, I think communication, um, like specifically newsletters are really good for, for me, it was really good for accountability. Like if you're working on your own project, I think like, um, having accountability is really good. So like if you can find someone to hold you accountable, maybe have like biweekly syncs with them. Uh, and then that's like a forcing function for you to actually do something because then you got to have something to update them on. Um, so for me, it was a similar thing with newsletters. It was it was a really good accountability in terms of making progress and making sure I have uh, like things that I've done or learned for that month. Um, so I just send them out once every month. It's super easy to, to send them out. You can automate the process using uh, there's like different applications. You can use MailChimp or MailerLite. Um, you can check those out if you want to start sending newsletters. Um, but yeah, if I if I meet someone at a conference or I have a good call with them, then I'll just add them on there for them to kind of stay updated with me. So that was a really good way for me to one, stay updated with people, but also stay accountable with my work. Um, and then when it came to blogging, I think it's really good because when you're learning like new complex topics, um, like for example, I remember I was trying to learn calculus um, and so I, I want to start getting more into blogging because I think it's a really good way to one, like convey your information and really understand how well do I understand it. Um, but then you're also thinking about conveying it to other people. And I think the best way to, to learn is to actually teach people. And so if you're doing that, it's also a good way to, to learn yourself. Um, so for me, those are kind of the two reasons why I, I like to blog. Um, if I'm working on a new project, I'll write a blog about it, helps me kind of consolidate my own thinking. Um, but also helps when you're learning new topics. Yeah, I think writing is a phenomenal way to test yourself, to test your own knowledge. And, and it does take a certain amount of bravery and confidence to be able to put your work out there. 
Um, we Anybody can publish, anybody can self-publish. You can write a blog on Medium, you can write posts on LinkedIn, and you put yourself out there for feedback and for criticism and um, engagement from other people. So it is a test, and um, but it's also a way to demonstrate to the world your commitment, your values, your interests, and how you want to position yourself as a thought leader, what, what's really important to you. So I think, um, you know, more young people at the outset of their career could could take a page out of your book and follow some of these strategies um, around blogging, around communications, around public speaking, in addition to to getting hands on in the lab, getting getting involved in in developing and uh, continuing uh, lifelong learning. Um, I would love to open up uh, the discussion and invite everybody to uh, uh, ask Alishba a question. Um, uh, here we go. And uh, how much support are developing countries able to supply to help you help them? Example, proper bandwidth to run the blockchain programs or legal aspects. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, right now, I'm still kind of in the midst of figuring that out. Um, one of the biggest interesting things is like, you'll find at least in the developing world, it's like incentives. So like, like what kind of incentives do people have to do something like this, right? Um, like oftentimes, in, especially in the counterfeit industry, like people are doing it because they get money off of it, right? And so there are there are aspects like that. And so for me right now, I'm figuring out more of the incentives, like what would be the best way to frame something like this? Uh, who's like the best kind of end user to use a platform like this within the entire like supply chain or all the people involved? Um, so that's one aspect of it is understanding incentives, really figuring out who is the best person to, to build this product for. Um, and I say second thing is there's obviously a lot of regulations and legal aspects of it. Um, but there, I mean, it's, I think it's a lot easier to, to get around those or even to just do those in the developing world. I think if you are trying to do it in, in like North America, there's, a, there's, it's a lot harder to, to get around that it takes a lot longer. Um, so still have to figure out kind of specifically what I have to do on that end, but at a high level, those are some of the things that I'm looking at. Yeah, and unfortunately, sometimes the barriers to access, even um, the internet, is is a problem in developing countries. And I think access to the internet, access to uh, connectivity, is not um, democratic. And when we can get more universal mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, maybe we'll be able to start seeing things happen in a more profound way. Um, mm -hmm. Another question: Do you mentor younger children? Um, a lot of people think they want to follow your lead already. Do you have anybody that you're mentoring, Lishba? Uh, not right now. I do have a lot of just like uh, people from the program that I mentioned earlier um, that I just kind of help provide advice to or we, we kind of do syncs. But I'm definitely open to it. It's something that I would be totally open to um, is providing mentorship. But I do have like, um, like I mentioned, I do have like medium where I post like blog posts. Uh, you can also follow me on like LinkedIn or Twitter. I always keep updated on the work that I'm doing and anybody can really reach out to me. Um, so yeah, I, I'm very open to helping out uh, anybody that I can. Yeah, I think um, mentees have a way of finding their mentors. That it, it can come quite naturally, and you'll find that people will reach out to you. What are your What are your future projects and aspirations? Yeah, um, as a future projects, I'm mainly just focusing on the robotic arm as well as the uh, energy storage right now. So just kind of learning a lot in that space and trying to. Uh, grow, you know, just grow the product, but also just learn a lot in this space. Um, so that's kind of what I'm focusing on right now. Um, but for the future, my goal is to, um, you know, either it's it's going to university. Um, so I still have another year of high school left. But after that, um, it would be potentially university. Um, but if not, I'm also looking at ways that I can kind of contribute to interesting projects in the world and and kind of hop on a team that's working on problems that I'm interested in. So that would be my goal for the future. Um, and then eventually I'm hoping I can, you know, get really passionate about one problem um, and hopefully start my own kind of venture in that space, trying to tackle uh, a problem and really implement it. Wow, well, I think the future is bright um, uh, with uh, with your contributions in it, with your brains in the game, Alishba. I would encourage everybody watching to connect with us, to uh, reach out on uh, the channels you mentioned, Twitter, LinkedIn, on Medium. Uh, we're both on there and uh, we're we're here to help. And so get involved and um, don't be shy. And I just wanna thank you for your for your time, Alishba, for everybody watching today. It's just such a pleasure 
uh, to have been able to participate in Campus Party and uh, all the best in your, um, uh, you know, your next journey. We'll, we'll probably see you at Blockchain Revolution Global in October. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome. Um, and yeah, in terms of social, uh, it's just my name. So it's just Alishba Imran. Uh, Twitter is Alishba Imran underscore. Um, and then LinkedIn is just my name. So feel free to reach out and I'd be more than happy to, to answer any other questions. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I think we're uh, we're wrapping this conversation and uh, we will we'll be in touch. If you want to learn more about the Blockchain Research Institute, we're blockchainresearchinstitute.org and blockchainrevolutionglobal.com is our uh, conference URL. Check us out and um, get involved. Thank you so much, everybody.